Okay, this is the bio that Bill sent me. Uh, Bill Paulson is a member of the Rotary Club of Needham. He is a realtor with Keller Williams, uh, focusing mostly on residential in Needham, Newton, and Wellesley area. Bill has been president of the Needham Club twice, uh, is an active member of their board currently. He is also currently the chair of the District 7910 Social Equity Task Force on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I have to tell you, Bill is passionate about this topic and he inspires and motivates the rest of us. I was talking about the relevance of the topic, uh, which is incredibly important right now, given Black Lives Matter. It's relevant here in the Brookline community, particularly. And I think it impacts on who we are, Rotary International, which is clearly diverse, and yet within our clubs here in the United States, not always. Um, so um, it impacts on membership and it impacts on who we are. And with, uh, we're gonna be doing visioning as I understand it at some time soon. And I think this is germane to the topic of visioning what Brookline Rotary will be in the future. And I'm gonna give it to Bill. Bill, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the work that you're doing on this. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Susan. I'm going to share my screen for you. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm, we're, uh, Susan and Ralph and I are all on the uh, District 7910 Social Equity Task Force. And we're working on, you know, we're, we're not alone. There's a number of um, social equity task forces or similar organizations in place around us and internationally. Uh, if you look at some definitions first, diversity, equity, and inclusion are out there a lot, those terms. So if we just define them for, so we have a common understanding, diversity is the presence of difference within a setting. So you can have a diversity of species within an ecosystem or a diversity of clothing brands in your closet or a diversity of opinion and experiences. And Rotary has a page that talks about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the words it uses are, Rotary welcomes people of all backgrounds, cultures, experiences, and identities. Equity, uh, sorry, equity is a, an approach that ensures everyone has access to the same opportunities. So equity recognizes that advantages and barriers exist and that not everybody starts from the same place. So, Equity is a process that begins by acknowledging those unequal starting places and makes a commitment to correct and adjust for the imbalance. And Rotary says, Rotary strives for the fair treatment, opportunity, and advancement of all Rotary participants. And inclusion talks about in involving people with different identities so that they feel like they're part of the program and that they're valued and leveraged in a given setting. So one participant that uh, was in one of these meetings said uh, that somebody had, they liked a quote that said, diversity is being asked to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And Rotary says, uh, it's working to create experiences where all people feel welcomed, respected and valued. And if you look at equality versus equity, Equality is where everybody gets the same boost and equity is where people get the boost they need in order to participate. And another way of looking at it, accessibility is being able to get in the building. Diversity is getting invited to the table. Inclusion is having a voice at the table and belonging is having your voice heard at the table. Uh, a really interesting, um, quote is without interchange, there can be no outer change and without collective change, no change matters. So right now, um, if we want, we have a problem uh, nationwide and if we wanna make any changes, we need to look within ourselves and make these changes from within and it has to come from everyone. There's an author and speaker, his name's Ibrahim Kendi, 
And he has written a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is very popular right now. And one of his quotes is, most of us are fighting to be exempt as part of the problem. And I consider myself as having been in that camp, like I kind of knew that there was a problem intellectually, but I didn't feel that there was a problem because it didn't really impact my life. And I was busy you know, with my family and with Rotary and with my business. So for me, it was just a, it was a problem that I knew was out there, but it wasn't really part of me. It wasn't something I was fighting for. And he also, I think is the one who said, has said that it's not a good, it's not good enough to be non-racist. We have to be anti-racist. And I always considered myself to be not racist. Not that I've never said a racist thing out of ignorance, but that I actively wouldn't have considered myself a racist but I don't think I ever would have considered myself an anti-racist until recently. So for me personally, it sort of gathered over time, right? There were all these events in the news uh, culminating with George Floyd's situation. And there were some, uh, in Needham there was, I live in Needham and there was a, a rally around George Floyd where everybody lined the street, the main drag going through town so I went, did that, said cool, went home. And then this, I, I'm an avid Patriots fan and they have a TV show called Patriots All Access and my DVR knows to record it for me. So I was looking at my DVR and look at that, there's a Patriots All Access. And it, it was at a weird time because this was months ago now and um, there wasn't much going on in the football world. So I was like, well, this is great. So I flipped it open and it was really nothing to do with Patriots. It was the Patriots organization having a conversation about race in America. So Steve Burton, the guy in the middle, is the MC of Patriots All Access. And he had gathered three panels of players and coaches to talk about this subject. And I wanna play a couple snippets for you. The first one was Jakob Johnson, who's the guy in the middle on the right. And he, um, he came from Germany. And let me play this here. You definitely have a long way to go. Jakob, you grew up in Europe? Yes, sir. United States. And what's the biggest change that you've seen since coming over here? Um, I mean, for me, coming to America was really the first time I experienced getting treated differently because of my skin color. I was always aware uh, that I was a little different in Germany uh, around the other kids. But, uh, <laughs> The fact that that I could be discriminated or treated badly because of the color of my skin, that didn't happen to me un, un, until I came over here. Brandon Copeland, I want to come to you next, my friend. So how crazy is that, right? The guy comes from Germany to the United States of America, you know, and the first time he gets treated differently because of the color of his skin is here in the United States. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I mean, this guy is in our midst, right? He lives in the Foxborough area somewhere, who knows where, but then the other guy is Steve Cargill, who's a coach, 440. And when you watch this, um, pay attention to the people around him and the waving of their heads, you know, they're acknowledging that what he's saying makes sense. Thanks for sharing your oh. DIY haircuts, your savage moves, and your adorable pets. Sorry about the Now commercial. it's our turn to share with the Geico Giveback, a 15% credit on car and motorcycle policies lasting your full policy term. So, thanks again. in terms of, you know, identifying talent, um, building teams, and you know, working with other people. All right, here we go. A little bit. Living as a Black man in America, just like the, the level of con consciousness that you, that you have to have, you know, when you leave the house every day, um, it's, it's pretty much an everyday struggle. Um, I live in a town townhome community where my trash bin is at the end of the complex. 
And, you know, we're, it's, it's getting kind of late right now. So, you know, instead of me saying, hey, well, I can take my trash out at 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there might be a, a problem with that. You know, if it's cold outside and I have a hoodie on and I'm coming back and somebody looks out the window and they see, you know, a tall, imposing black man that they feel is threatening, you know, that can turn into a situation where the police are called and, you know, I mean, we, we, we've seen this happen before in, in different situations. So, um, you know, just as a black man, the level of consciousness you have to have just on a day in and day out basis, having those conversations in terms of dealing with authority and dealing with police officers, um, you know, just every, every, everyday conversation, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we have to deal with. You know how we're going to close this out because for this. So crazy, right? Like I would never, ever, ever, ever have thought about that. Like if my wife says, take the trash out, I'm taking the trash out. It's 10 o'clock at night. It doesn't matter, you know, and to have that sort of a thought process constantly in your head, it's got to be exhausting. Right. And again, this is in our midst. This is in a Massachusetts, a pretty liberal state. Right. So I watched this whole thing and I would recommend it. If you guys, the link is right here. If, if you guys want to, um, or you can search for do your part Patriots all access special. Um, if you're interested in the subject, that it's a fascinating uh, conversation with all these guys. So I, I definitely recommend it. So I watched that. I, I did the, the rally for George Floyd. And then I went to this rally at Needham High School where a bunch of high school kids were talking about their experience growing up in Needham. And, you know, they're, they're mostly African-American, but certainly all minorities. And they're talking about growing up in Needham. Some of them grew up in Needham and some of them spent a lot of time in Needham as MECO students, sort of a mixture. But there's this one guy who lived in Needham, grew up in Needham. And he said, when I was 11 years old, there was an early release day from the middle school. And on an early release day, we all walk uptown and get something to eat and sit on the square and talk to our friends, right? Or at least they did before COVID. So, I go, he, the kid goes to Walgreens, which is right on the square. He gets himself something to eat. He goes and he pays and he's on his way out the door and he's 11 years old now, right? Somebody scruffs the kid, grabs him by the back of the neck and says, you're a long way from home, aren't you kid? And he's 11, what does he know? You know, he doesn't know what this guy's asking or implying. He's a couple miles from home. His house is a couple miles away from Walgreens. So he's like, yeah. And the, before you know it, the guy's dumping his backpack upside down on the floor, looking for to see if there's something he might have stolen. There's just no way that would have happened if he was a white kid. You know, there's just no way. And on and on and on, these kids are telling stories about, like that about their experience growing up in Needham. It was just, it was very moving for me, you know. And then the uh, Needham Select Board had a open hearing COVID style on Zoom where they address the subject. And this guy here uh, spoke to the group and I was amazed by that as well. Let me uh, get rid of this one. Uh, the floor is yours and welcome. Hi, can you see me? Uh, yes, I can see you. How you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Oluswan Fayemi. I've lived in Needham for the last 13 years. I grew up in a suburb of New York. I went to uh, Yale University for my undergraduate degree and to Harvard Med School for my medical, medical degree. So I'm no stranger uh, to be surrounded by faces that look very different uh, from my own. I can tell you that several times a year in this town, I'll have an interaction um, that is extremely unpleasant. And I would say every couple of years, I'll have an interaction uh, that makes me want to move out of Needham. Um, some of the reactions have been as bad as being followed home because a person can't believe that I live in Needham. Uh, once having the police called on me because someone didn't believe the house that I had keys to was my own house, despite my neighbor even telling this person that this was my house. Um, I, you know, I turned 50 this year. I'm not sure there's much the town can do to improve my personal experience. Um, but I can speak, I can speak to what it's done to my children. Um, our, we have two children. Our son went to Needham from first grade to 12th grade. And I can tell you that he was never recommended 
for any accelerated courses or advanced courses. Uh, if it wasn't for our own advocacy, his education would have stalled. Uh, by senior year, he was taking all APs or accelerated courses and getting A's in most of them. Uh, our daughter, who made it through seventh grade, we pulled out of school. Um, she was part of the group from the or uh, aforementioned by, um, I think it was Jennifer, that was segregated. But it wasn't just that, it was that she had uh, routine interactions with people, uh, telling them that she wasn't good enough, that she was biracial, that she didn't belong, um, people using uh, names like KKK in their group names and thinking that was okay. So we pulled her out of school, she's, she's in private school. Um, my recommendation to everyone is that we need to learn about the past, um, especially our children. There, there's no Black History Month, uh, and, and we use the excuse that Black history is taught uh, throughout the curriculum. And I can tell you that my children know nothing about slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, civil rights, redlining, and the, and the list goes on. Um, and as long as we still we continue to ignore the past, we're going to do exactly what we're doing. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Um, thank you for listening. I don't like to preach, but we just need to learn. Thank you. So crazy, right? I mean, I don't know. It's just, um, I guess I knew that there were issues, but I didn't know. I was, I had no way of putting myself in their shoes until I heard directly from them. And I, I submit that, I, I, I hope that Needham is not an outlier, I mean, how personally, I guess, because I live in Needham, but I hope, I hope we're an outlier, but I don't know if, I don't think we are. I think there's it's probably fun. all towns in our area are like this, where there's an undercurrent of racism that's in, that exists that, uh, makes it really hard for people that are minorities to live in our midst. It happens. So um, we have a uh, web page. Districts, the Social Equity Task Force has a web page, and we stole a lot of it from our, the district to our east, 7930. And one of the things we have on our web page is a really great link called the 10 Best DEI Corporate DEI Videos. And looking at them, these are uh, high budget videos put together by major corporation HR departments to talk to their people and try and encourage their people to be understanding and welcoming to other people. So this one by salesforce.com I thought was really great. So I'll, I'll play a little bit of that for you. At a very young age, we learned to make a distinction between you and me. Simple, right? But what if somehow? What if somehow? I could see the world from your perspective. And you could see it from mine. Think for a second. I know all your hopes and dreams. E tudo que te incomoda. Or aap ko bhi wo pata chale mere baare mein. You know what it's like to have a daughter who struggles with is she black enough, is she white enough? You would know what it's like to not have enough confidence to express your ideas. You'd know what it would be like for people to take your culture and turn it into a theme party. You would know that every time that you say you have a husband, people pause. To be gender non-conforming. To be comfortable being uncomfortable a lot of times. You know what it's like to lose your little brother to HIV. You'd know that there is struggle and pain, but also a lot of hope. And suddenly... Suddenly... And suddenly we would see... That although our lives are very different... They are also very much the same. And that bigger than you and me... Is us. Novel. And as us, we know this. You don't have to look like us. Worship like us. Live like us. Or love like us. To stand with us. Of course, you'll always be you. And I'll always be me. But there's nothing stopping us. There's nothing stopping us. There's nothing stopping us. There's nothing stopping us from becoming us. Ngote. Needs it to be. Kami. Nosotros. Women. Nos. We're stronger as us. We're stronger as allies.
How great is that, huh? <laughs> really good. Yeah. They hit the mark there, I think. So um, what's happening in other, other product, what's happening in this space, right? There's a lot of corporations and government agencies working on this topic. It seems like there's more activity than ever. And it just makes sense for Rotary to ask the question of like, what's our role in this? If you look at the Boston Celtics, they've put $25 million behind this and they've come up with these areas where they're gonna focus. Equity in education, economic opportunity and empowerment, equity in healthcare, breaking down barriers and building bridges across communities and voting and civic engagement. So we'll be seeing over the next, come, you know, over the coming years, them putting money into these different areas. My company, Keller Williams, has created a social equity task force at the corporate level and then at the regional level and then at the market center, there's equivalents to that. And they've come up with, uh, like the Celtics, a set of areas where they want us to focus. I think that we can do uh, a lot of good, including they, they've put together a $100 million community give back program a lot of it focused on trying to help uh, minorities get their buy that first home and helping minority real estate agents in their careers. So why Rotary? Like, why should we play a role in this? And what does it mean? Is it too political? Is it not political enough? Well, if you look at our organization, I mean, diversity is all over us, right? Like Rotary International is incredibly diverse that we have clubs in Uganda and in India and in Canada and Taiwan. If you go to the, the international convention, there's a bazillion flags representing all the people that are at the convention. And we have Rotary Peace Fellows that go out into the world sharing their culture to try and um, push for peace worldwide, right? So this is a game that we're in, peace through understanding. Equity, you know, we do a lot with equity, right? We're trying to help people and give them a leg up so that they can live a good life the way we live our lives. In India, we put a solar array on a school so that their operational funds won't go towards electricity and instead they can use them to buy books and pencils and paper. In Tanzania, we're building water wells so that they don't have to hike for miles to get their water for their daily living. And the gift of life, does life-saving heart operations for kids from other countries who don't have the medical facilities in place to save their lives, literally saving lives. So equity is a concept that we're all well familiar with. And inclusion, you know, we rotate the, RI president rotates every year between one country to another. And in terms of age, we're dealing with all different ages. And in terms of race, Across Rotary International, we're doing an amazing job. Within each of our own clubs, I don't know, maybe not as inclusive. It's something that we need to look at as a, each club needs to evaluate it on its own. So Rotary for a hundred years has been doing peace through understanding, right? We've been sent out ambassadorial scholars. We send out Rotary Youth Exchange students and we do uh, service projects internationally with the idea of trying to bring people together by helping them understand each other. And our membership is incredibly diverse. And um, I think my opinion is that we're perfectly positioned to leverage these experiences closer to home and to make a big difference in this space. So Rotary International has a, a, a group that's focusing on this and they have a web page on the Rotary International website. And the Rotary International statement is, as a global network that strives to build a world where people unite to take action to create lasting change, Rotary values diversity and celebrates the contributions of all people, of all backgrounds, regardless of their age, ethnicity, race, color, abilities, religion, socioeconomic status, culture, sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And if you look at, at the bottom of that page, you can see the images coming up. There's diversity, equity, and inclusion statements. And those are the ones that I read earlier. Paul Harris, of course, a long time ago said, 
This is a changing world and we must be prepared to change with it. The story of Rotary will have to be written again and again. So where are we? You know, like, are we with COVID and the changes we're looking at for COVID, are we still a lunch club, you know, a bunch of lunch clubs or dinner clubs that get together and do service organizations locally and internationally? Is that who we are? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. What's the, are we still gonna meet uh, in person or are we gonna continue meeting in Zoom after all this is over? Is that a way to get more people involved? There's so, so many questions you talk about visioning. There's so many questions about where we're going as an organization. So our task force is still pretty new. We have nine members from eight clubs. We're looking for additional members and we're working on mission statements, priorities and action plans. But we have added a, a web page to so 7910 and it looks like this. Uh, it sort of shamelessly steals from both the uh, Rotary International website as well as 7930. And our mission is uh, to basically be a resource for our clubs and help them under, understand the space and, and do work in the space within their communities if that's something that they wanna do. So we're gonna be providing training and materials to help our clubs do that work. And priorities that we've put together similar to the other organizations diversity, training, and education, club, club membership diversity, community give back initiatives, and minorities in leadership positions. Those are priorities that we're working on. If we look at Brookline, the demographics, and this is stolen shamelessly from a website and is most likely not exactly accurate, but it's close enough for our purposes today. Um, you know, you guys are 69% white, according to this. And there's a African American component, there's an Asian component, and there's a mixed race component and a Hispanic, Hispanic component. So there's a lot of um, diversity within your, uh, or there's some diversity within your community, which is great. And the town has actually has an organization, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Community Relations that's working in the space. And they have uh, activities that they're doing and this from back in May that the Brookline launches diversity community virtual display. And um, you know, so it's, it's interesting that there's work going on in your community. So what's next? As a task force, we're working to diversify and expand. Anything? We're also um, conducting looking to help clubs conduct diversity assessments. And if you Google Rotary Club Assessment, you'll find a, a PDF and chapter three is around diversity. We're looking to perform DEI training for as many clubs as possible. And I see that as a second wave of discussions. Like this, this is more of an awareness, who is the Social Equity Task Force and what are we doing? And I hope to be coming back to you in the future with DEI training that uh, can be put into action by your club. And we're also working on the criteria for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion citation. So you may know about the, a presidential citation for your club. If you fill out the, there's a rubric, and if you fill out all the goals and you meet your goals at the district assembly, your club might be awarded a presidential citation. And we're looking to put, uh, put together a DEI citation that would be awarded at the district assembly if your club is doing work in this area. So that's, look for that coming sometime soon here. There is a Rotary Action Group that's been created for DEI and there's also a global DEI task force that's just been created. So we're keeping in touch with those people and hoping to see some interesting things come out of of those organizations in the coming you know, months and years. And then there's an event coming up on October 29th at 6.30. Bowtie Jenkins is a, uh, it's his picture here on the right. And he is a, um, a Rotarian. He's also a motivational speaker and he does a lot of uh, training and you know, facilitated discussions around the subject of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
And he is going to do uh, an event called Moving from Diversity to Inclusive Opportunities for All. And that is being hosted by the Boston district to our east. So um, in terms of your club, you know, you might consider inviting your town's diversity organization to come be a speaker at your club. And looking for ways to partner is always great. And it sounds like you may already be doing some of this, um, these partnership activities at your club and identify something, somebody to be your DEI leader. So there's a lot to be done. It's still real early days for this, but we wanted to get out and let you know that we exist and that we're doing some work in this space and answer any questions you might have. Uh, I, I would just like, oh, is it all right to, for me to say something now? Yes, sure, absolutely. Oh, okay. Um, you, you mentioned Ibram X. Kendi. Yeah. He's a professor at Boston University. He just recently been brought in, yeah, to start yeah. a department there, Well, yeah. it's almost a year now, but at any rate, uh, it would be great. You know, he's written a new book, Stamped from the Beginning, which his books are marvelous. And, and the town, the diversity committee has used his first book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, a lot. But I think it would be great if somehow Rotary could make that bridge. Kendi is just incredible. And, and the fact that he teaches at BU is, that's good, that's a plus. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's um, could I say something? Sure. Um, hi, I'm at BU. He is really busy. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I know. Um, so I know because Brooklyn Adult Ed has been in touch with him too. Yeah. I know how busy he is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we can always make arrangements for our club to attend some of his virtual activities. That's a good and idea. He also has a research center. Um, it's late now to apply for any of the, the, the grants. And I, I think it's right now for students and faculty, um, but you know, there's always you know, creative ideas um, that can happen with him. Yeah, you're a good connection, yeah. Right. I don't know him personally. No, I know, but, I, but yeah. But you're very respected on the campus, so. Karen, it, if you send me the information about his virtual lectures, I will share it not only with the club, but with the committee bill. Yeah, he's That's done a lot of them already. In fact, his wife um, is a pediatrician and she gave a, a presentation, um, I think it was last week. Um, she's at Boston Medical Center. So they both are amazing. So I'll look and see, um, Susan, if he's doing anything anytime recent, you know, upcoming. And I'll also have the link for his research center, which might have um, some of that information. Terrific, thank you. And, and also, just to say it again, go down to the Brookline Booksmith and get his second book stamped from the beginning. Good for the booksmith, good for Mr. Kendi, or Professor <laughs> Kendi. Thank you. Um, and first off, thank you. That was full, interesting, and worthwhile. And yes. I really appreciate uh, all that you've done. And now uh, I'd like to ask you what you have done or what are you doing in your work to uh, overcome the barriers to uh, wealth, dignity that are closed to so many people of color, especially African-Americans. There is redlining, there is steering, there is, I mean, this is all documented. You know this, I know this. Uh, there, there are uh, fewer um, listings shown. There is steering, uh, but lack of support <laughs> for for getting mortgages and so on and so on and so on. So, what are you doing about it? That's an excellent question, and, and those are um, square in the bullseye with what Keller Williams, in any way, is doing in its social equity task force. The um, you know working on helping first-time home buyers in minority areas to understand how to get a mortgage and how, what the home buying process is like and wealth building among the real estate agent community, the minority real estate agent community. So there's, there's a lot of um, initiatives in that space. 
Absolutely. Okay. okay. I mean, I think in Brookline, as in Newton, uh, while there is uh, subsidized housing and so forth, there are also an awful lot of people of color, uh, like the like the doctor who spoke, who are very sophisticated. They're not first time buyers. They just get doors shut in their face, or only open to crack or something. And personally, that's very concerning to me. I, I, I know I've been part of the problem. I acknowledge that, but I'd also hope that we can be part of the solution. And I think it's gonna take some, uh, uh, some pointed effort and uh, a little bit of willingness to be, uh, say, do um, things that make other people, our colleagues and friends uncomfortable because it ain't gonna change by us reading more books. There is a, I think you, you bring up an excellent point. And I think there's like, I went through, I personally went through a little bit of a, of a process, you know, and getting people to doing events like this and events that like we're doing at our market centers around the New England region to introduce this subject to people in a, in a very strong way to that they think of, they're starting to think about it more than just have being aware of it is a start. Um, but it's a, it's a long, it's going to be a long process to try and deal with this. So it has to be dealt with at a number of levels. So, you know, within my organization, we have a, I'm part of the New England region social equity task force for Keller Williams. I'm also obviously on the Rotary social equity task force. And to me, I think Rotary has a ton of power, potentially, a lot of potential to make a big difference in this space. There's a lot of communities have diversity organizations, but Rotary, um, especially if you look at our reputation, good or bad, the stereotype Rotary thing is a bunch of old white guys getting together for lunch, right? right. And if we're, out, if we're putting ourselves out there and partnering with these diversity organizations, bringing our ability to make things happen in our communities to the table, um, I think it sends a really strong message. And there's a, I think there's an awareness, there's a, a perception and attitude change that we, that we need to make. And I, I think we're in a really good place to make it. I, I think uh, that I just would like to mention that the Greater Boston Real Estate Board sends out people who are uh, calling themselves buyers. And what they're doing is testing the brokers and how they present house. And these are black people, of course, that are uh, they're uh, masquerading as buyers when in fact they work for the Greater Boston Real Estate Board. And that's been upped a lot. They've hired quite a few new people within the past a, two months. We just got a uh, note on that at our business meeting on Tuesday. Yeah, no, it's been going on for years, but it, yeah. it, they've, they've upped, they've hired a lot of new brokers um, in the past two months to really clamp down because you can lose your license of course and I can tell you as a real estate broker that over the years many times I've seen the look on the seller's face and they say you know you can't um well uh you you know what I mean <laughs> meaning don't bring don't bring people of color is what they're saying and this right, been going turn, on, of course for years and years if you turn, yeah, so I'd like to I'd like this is fantastic Bill great Great presentation and Brookline Rotary Club, great discussion. And George, I want to share a little bit about St. Paul's at some time with you too. Um, please keep me in your email loop. It sounds like you guys are in a, on a good track and I want to be right in with what's happening. So thanks a lot for holding this meeting. Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, yeah, a two part thing. Um, so one is thank you so much that this, this was wonderful. Um, I was very lucky, by the way, and I don't know if this is still going on, when I taught in Concord, 
um, they required us, and this is years ago, to take a two-year anti-racism class, which all of this came through at that time. So I was lucky to have that awareness. And just to share one wonderful experience, I was teaching third grade, and I had this little girl from the METCO program who was black from Boston. And um, I was you know, sharing all of what I was going through and she raised her hand and she said, why is it when they call the buses to go home that every bus in Concord has a number and ours is called METCO. So I ran her down to the principal, an eight year old, left my class, I don't know what I did with that. And from that day on, and we're talking about 25 years ago, it's changed and that's not no longer. So kids can make a difference. But I wanted to have a couple other points. One is, in addition to how critical this diversity is, it's a much bigger issue around how Rotary presents. Constantly, 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 I hear from people, I never would go uh, even think about Rotary because I thought you had to own a business and I thought you had to be male. So we need to get that out there and it's happening right now, this minute. Um, so I think that's another critical thing. The other thing that I always worry about, if we have a lot of diversity in the population in Brookline, but often most of it, which you've always said, are people that are compromised economically, not everybody. And how do we say you come to the club because we're giving money to these people and we're really not getting their input. And I want them to be equal. That's what I love about Karen Jacobs program where it's women um, with the cooking, it's us Rotarians and them, and we're all doing it together. And so I think we have to really, I was thinking of like ways, well, maybe we don't do it the right time of the day or they can't afford it. And, um, but maybe we need to survey these people in the community, especially since we have a relationship with this group and find out what would make it possible for you to join. And obviously we're not gonna have a scholarship for everyone, but we need to hear those voices. That's the way I feel. Joyce. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just add to that, that several of us have approached leaders who are of different races in the community and have invited them to join Rotary and often they say, so what do you want from me? I don't want to just be the token black or the token Chinese or something like that. Can, can you give us any insights into approaches that have worked for you in trying to include other voices in our discussions? I think that's, a, I mean, that's gonna be a problem. Somebody's gotta be first, right? Right. Um, one thing you might consider is trying to, I mean, it sounds like you're working with some of these organizations already, but like um, one thing we've talked about is celebrating our diversities. If we, if you are active about um, celebrating diversity, then maybe people will look at you in a different way. So um, like in Needham, we did a, an event, and I guess it was, it wasn't this last year because school got cut short, but I guess it was the year before where one of the schools had a multicultural event and we sponsored it. And they had, you know, in the school, they had families from, with backgrounds of all over the world. And each of the families was offered the ability to set up a table with information about their home country. And there was a food area. And then there was a performance area where people could do dances. And there were probably 20 different countries represented and we, we paid for a big banner map of the world and put it up in the lobby of the school like a month ahead of time. And as people came in the school, they were offered the ability to put a pin where they were from. And it was incredible to see all the pins on the, on the map. And they were not all represented. It was much more than 20 um, where they, these people were from. And then um, of the countries that were represented, we pulled a name out of a hat and we ended up donating $1,000 to the uh, Rotary Club in the hometown of this Greek family. Oh, and they used it to buy CPR dummies to train the schools. And uh, it was just a really wonderful uh, event because 
celebrating all these different countries from all over the world, it was square in the bullseye of Rotary. And it was great to, you know, make that connection internationally. And I, I actually still keep in touch with the guy in Greece that um, was my counterpart on the other side of that. So, I mean, you guys have diversity there and, and celebrating it would be maybe a way of, of encouraging them to work with you on a project and then maybe bring them in. Elias, you had something to say? Yeah, I, uh, I, I like to thank you very much, Bill, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, it really taught us a lot. And uh, it brought home with me a whole lot of experiences <laughs> that have I experienced it myself and also my kids and other members of my family being an immigrant to, to this country. Uh, and uh, I, I, what I really, uh, you know, the, the videos, the audio visuals you put uh, were so true. I mean, I have seen it. I have worked in the past uh, when I was very young with Mel King in Boston when he used to run for the uh, mayor of Boston. I don't know if you know who Mel King is. My home was stoned almost weekly because I had a sign in my front yard. And that's what rocks really. So as a society, yeah, we, we kind of uh, have moved away from this issue quite a bit, but we still have a lot of work to do. And discrimination also, what I have been experiencing it, and I have been experiencing within my own community, it's not only race, it's religious. Uh, it, it's so much there and uh, so much there in a very mean and bitter way uh, that it, it's, uh, it's worth uh, uh, looking into it. Uh, so discrimination, inclusion uh, is it's a big issue. And I agree with you. And I truly thank you for this presentation. Now we should do, and I agree with George, we should do more ourselves here. Excellent, well, thank you. On that note, um, I'd like to thank you for the club. It was a wonderful presentation. I will note for you that it is now 110, and that is the first time a meeting of the club has run overtime since I was president. <laughs> I became president. And no one looked at the watch. You, yeah, which tells you that this was a good presentation. Good job, Steve nice. and Brookline Rotarians. You're the best. Oh, thank you. <laughs> come again. Come, come, come.